So our first speaker is Stefan Gold. You have seen and you heard from him today. Uh, and uh, I do not need to introduce him further, but he is one of our ex-president for the International Society for Reproductive Surgery and Fallopian Tube. And he has done a lot of work in Fallopian Tube. But this lecture on adenomyosis is a special lecture. It's something really worth listening to. Uh, it is quite unique in its own way. So do listen. Thank you very much, Kamal. So I thank you again for inviting me to give this lecture. And uh, I all admire you that you stayed till the end to have this, uh, hear this lecture and this difficult stuff because some other difficult uh, topics will come uh, to, be, to be discussed. So I will go with you to the definition of pathogenesis, the diagnosis, the impact of fertility on uh, adenomyosis on fertility, the impact of adenomyosis on IVF, and then finally we will come to, uh, to come conclusion. Now, if you go to the pathogenesis, I think we have three different uh, definitions. We have the pathology, in fact it is an invasion of, uh, of gland in the myometrium, deeper than 2.5 mm from the uh, and the medical junction zone with smooth mus muscular hyperplasia. If you go to imaging, then the imaging tells us on MRI that the junction zone should be more than 12 mm with focal thickening of the junction zone of a focal uh, adenomyotic uh, nodule. And the clinical symptoms are pain, dysmenorrhea, menorrhagia, and infertility. Now, in fact, what happened was that initially, uh, adenomyosis was an histological diagnosis. So the diagnosis of adenomyosis was made at the moment of hysterectomy because patient received an hysterectomy because of men, men, of men, of men region. And uh, at that, based on that incidence, varied between 5 to 70 percent uh, of this patient and it are all retrospective studies. Now, with the introduction of the indirect imaging techniques, as ultrasound and MRI, in fact, adenomyosis becomes a clinical entity and it will make us life very difficult because we really do not know how to handle this. And because women are becoming older, but they're going to see us to become pregnant, the older they are becoming, the more higher the incidence of adenomyosis will be in these in this patients. So, the sophisticated techniques of indirect imaging and MRI and the concept of Archimetra makes from adenomyosis a totally different world we didn't exist 15, 15 or 20 years ago. Now, if you look at the uh, juncture zone, the juncture zone, and you probably you know, is in fact the layer which is just under the endometrium and which can easily be seen on MRI. And now with 3D ultrasound, if you have really an expert in ultrasound, you can also see it on ultrasound, on 3D ultrasound, where you have a coronal, uh, a coronal view. And in fact, if you look at the myometrium, you have the inner myometrium and the outer myometrium. The inner myometrium is the juncture zone, and the juncture zone is of malarian origin, while the outer, uh, while the outer myometrium is from non-malarian origin. So it's different. So, and the juncture zone also is hormonal dependent. So, the, there will be some contraction of the juncture zone depending upon the cycle phase the patient, the patient is. This I already have said. So, the uh, presence of endometrial glands, the reason why it's inside of the myometrium is mostly due to a trauma which can be atrogenic at the moment of DNC of uh, uterine sur surgery in some cases. But there is also the problem of uterine pathology, which in fact creates autotraumatization of the junctus of the junctus zone. Now, if we look at these contractions, this is a 2D ultrasound, and you see how the contractions of the junctus zone are going here, and depending on the phase of the cycle, these contractions are going from the cervix up to the fundus in the late follicular phase at the moment of ovulation and you're going from the fundus till the cervix in the late luteal phase at the moment of menstruation. And we know that in patients with adenomyosis and endometriosis from publications from Leyendecker and Kunz, that this, this, that this peristalsis 
which is completely disturbed in those patients with endometriosis and adenomyosis, which results in a much higher retrograde menstruation in those patients with much higher flu of menstrual blood in the patch of, of the blood. So these are the contractions which you can see here. The inter-observer variation is very good and also the inter-observer variation. So with two deultrasound, if you a little bit uh, if you take time, you can see these contractions and you can measure the contractions. You have about four to five contractions every ten minutes, which means a thousand single contractions at the end of each ovulatory cycle. This results in a local inflammation and proliferation of the basal endometrium into the uterine wall. And so we have not only an invasion of the endometrium into the myometrium, but we have really a displacement of all fragments of endometrium into the intramural part because the cystic, uh, the cystic uh, uh, appearances, you can see that also the cystic uh, adenomyotic lesions are surrounded by some, uh, some junctus zone com com component, which really uh, indicates that we have really a displacement and not only an, an invasion. We know that the prevalence of endometriosis in adenomyosis is about 80.6%. And the prevalence of adenomyosis in endometriosis is 91%. This is a publication of Lyandek recently published in 2014. So there's a connection between adenomyosis and endometriosis. And so in both in adenomyosis and endometriosis, we have what we are calling the TR, which is in fact the tissue injury and repair. So you have a continuous tissue injury, which then is going to repair, which finally will result in fibrosis, in adenomyosis, and also in, in, in endometriosis. Now comparing endometriosis and adenomyosis, both are extra cavitary localization, in case of endometriosis, due to retrograde menstruation, in case of adenomyosis, due to disruption of the lamina basalis, and this is due to the uterine dysperistalsis which occurred in those pathology, and this uterine peristalsis is reinforced by the production of estrogen and higher incidence of P450 aromatizers in those patients. I will be very short here. So we know that there is dysregulation of the myometrial architecture, and also there is an altered endometrial function. So there are several aspects, I will not go into detail, but which effects is there is local inflammation also into, into the myometrium and there are several factors into the endometrioma, uh, endometrium in patients with adenomyosis which in fact are altering the implantation rate in some of these, in some of these patients. Now given the fact that the presence of adenomyosis involves alterations of the myometrium and alterations of the endometrium of the junctus zone, it seems reasonable to hypothesize that the existence of a relationship between infertility and reproduction, although up to now there are no epidemiological evidence upon this topic. Diagnosis, as already has been said, it can be done by 2D ultrasound, but better with 3D ultrasound, where you can see the coronal, in coronal plane, the junctus zone here, in, in hands of exacustos, accuracy of 89%, sensitivity of 91%. This is operator dependent, while if you go to uh, MRI, MRI is less operator dependent, so if you really have to, to do some studies, I think we have to go to, uh, to MRI uh, to uh, have a very nice picture. If you are speaking about the myotis, please specify what you are speaking about. Is it a diffuse lesion? Is it a folk lesion? Is it an hyperplasia, as you can see here? Or is it an adenomyoma? Or is it, in those cases, a cystic adenomyotic lesion? Because if you put everything in one basket, then we will not know what we are talking about. Because we, at this very moment, we do not know the impact of these different types of adenomyosis upon reproductive production. So, if you make a publication of your doing so research, please specify what we are talking about. Hysteroscopy, yes. Uh, you can see the strawberry pattern. Is this the first sign of adenomyotic? We don't know. This is a cystic adenomyotic lesion. This is a hypervascularization, which you can see at hysteroscopy. These are adenomyotic defects, 
clearly seen at this stroscopy into the uterine, into the uterine cavity. So this is video of this stroscopy. You have a small uh, tube console with myoma here. And for the rest, you can say it is normal, but you have some lesions here. And if you lower the pressure, but you have really to lower the pressure, you see this abnormal vascularization, which is present here. So if you go with a scissor in this place, you can see that once you open it, that the fluid, the brownish fluid is coming out. So this is a supercosal adrenomyotic system which is sitting there. So it's so important that you perform also ultrasound before you're going to do this strategy, because otherwise you will miss it and you have to look for it. And if you look inside, you clearly can see that this has in some way the same aspect as an endometriotic system. You have some vascularization, and in some of these lesions, you have really endometrial-like tissue inside of this adenomyotic system. So, and in this case, we did the dissection of this adenomyotic lesion. So it's not so easy to have a hysteroscopy a real di different cell diagnosis if it's really adenomyotic or is it in some cases uh, a myoma. And so we are, uh, we work now, uh, are developing a, a, a device, a biopsy device, which in fact is a helix and which gives us the possibility to have a forward, direct, a direct forward bi biopsy. And this has the advantage that we really have a very nice picture, uh, a very nice, uh, uh, very nice sample of tissue uh, where otherwise if you take with forceps you have only a few millimeters of the tissue which is not enough to have to have it to have the diagnosis. And I will show you uh, the uh, the procedure how it works. So you turn the helix in, so the helix is about one centimeter in length, so it's huge, it looks huge, but it's not so huge, it's very small. Uh, it's a it's a seventh range instrument. And so once you are in, you're putting the cutting knife for forward. You're cutting the helix out, and then you put you're putting all the system back. And one of the marvelous things of this uh, of this instrument, and I do really not know why, is that when you're putting it back, it, it's not bleeding. We never have got any bleeding, and it's used in uh, in, in a thicker uh, in a thicker di diameter for uh, sampling of breast cancer, and also uh, they are taking biopsies from bones. Uh, on the local on the local anesthesia, so you can do this uh, biopsy under local anesthesia or without any form of anesthesia, and you're performing the procedure. So this is a small hole this stage. Uh, this stage. So we have now a tool where at least we can uh, do some research, because if you look at the juncture zone on normal histology, uh, the uh, normal histology cannot see the difference between the outer myometrium and the inner myometrium. So you really need some other tools, uh, immunohistochemistry, to, uh, to uh, do this examination. So which is the impact on fertility? We know from a publication from Jan Brosens that in case of subfertility, dysmenorrhea and menorrhagia, the incidence of adenomyosis in those patients is about 50%. I already told you the uh, correlation between endometriosis and, and adenomyosis. So there is a very high incidence of uh, adenomyosis in patients with, uh, with adenomyosis. Impairing the probability of spontaneous conception, uh, in data uh, where they are operating patients for deep endometriosis and where they are performing, performing some colorectal uh, resections, uh, when adenomyosis is present, then you can see that the pregnancy rate in those patients afterwards is lower than in patients when there is no adenomyosis present. These are the same data from uh, from Alistair, where you can see in association with adenomyosis that the pregnancy rate is lower than when there is no, so, no adenomyosis. So if you remove surgically adenomyosis, you increase your, your pregnancy rate. These are recent data published in 2016, where you can see that when you do surgery plus gestrinone, this is A, that your pregnancy rate is much lower, it's much higher, sorry, than, we do, than when you do only sur surgery or when you give it only gestrinone. So the uh, message is that if you operate upon patients with adenomyosis, that post or postoperatively you have to uh, give uh, some gestrinone or eventually some generation on of those patients. Also, uh, related to the, uh, rec uh, to the recurrence rate, uh, the recurrence rate is much lower in the combined group with surgery and, and gestrinone than 
when you do only searching or give yes to no. So what is the impact uh, of adenomyosis on, on IVF? There is a study of the group of uh, Martins Conjero from, uh, from, Spain, from Spain, where they looked at the presence of the implantation genes, if there is any difference in those patients with adenomyosis related to, to controls. And so there was no difference in the implantation genes in those patients. So she could not see that there was a difference in implantation in those patients. But there was an increased uh, uh, miscarriage rate in the patient with uh, abortion rate compared to uh, the controls where the, abortion, the miscarriage rate was, was low. Important to notice here is that those patients uh, in this group are all, always equipped with IVF with a long uh, suppression of GnRH before starting the ovulation, ovulation detection. The first, uh, one of the first in, in fact mentioned the uh, negative impact of a thickening of the junction zone upon the implantation rate or pregnancy rate of the IVF is the group of Maubon in France, I think they are from Limoges or some, something like that, I think, where you clearly see when the um, juncture zone is uh, larger than 7 millimeter, that the pregnancy rate, patients are getting pregnant, not getting pregnant, is 74%, and even when it's thicker, it's 86%. So these four patients, we've already failed uh, two or three failed IVF uh, before they did this, uh, this, this procedure. Now, does it really has an impact? So, looking in the literature, then in some publications you see that there is no difference in pre pregnancy rate. Sometimes it's reduced, like here, reduced, reduced, no difference, no difference. Now, looking at these pub publications, all those where there is no difference are all using a long uh, suppression protocol before uh, uh, starting the ovulation, uh, ovulation in, in, in induction. And there is one nice study, uh, recently published, uh, well, recently in 2013, where they performed the trio transfer uh, of embryos and they treated patients with generation analog uh, and then the uh, estradiol and, and progesterone. And then in, in another group, they just give estradiol and, and progesterone. And you can, you can see the difference here. So if you give a, a hormonal suppression, the clinical pregnancy rate is 51% versus 24-4%, implantation rate 32 versus 16 ongoing pregnancy rate. So the suppression of, uh, the hormonal suppression has a positive impact upon your adenomyotic region, probably by reducing the, reducing the inflammatory process and also by, as I will show you, by reducing the uh, size of the adenomyotic, adenomyotic region. And this is also, uh, this is the meta-analysis of Fasoline, which, uh, which you know, Clinical, uh, clinical pregnancy rate, yes, adenomyosis has a negative impact. Abortion rate, yes, abortion rate in patients with adenomyosis is higher. And if you look at the long or shorter protocol, the long protocol has a positive effect, better pre pregnancy rate than when you're going to uh, a short protocol. Now, I had a look if using this GnRH agonist, if this has really an impact upon the uh, size of the uh, adenomyotic, adenomyotic lesion, and in fact, yes, there is an increase in juncture zone thickness, there is a disappearance of the high intensity foci, and asymmetric adenomyosis with high intensity fo foci appears to be the most sensitive to the hormonal uh, therapy. It's all, all small groups, not huge data on large groups of patients, but we have four, four patients, three before adenomyoma, LRH, uh, analog for six months, all due to a decrease in size, uh, and three out of four became pregnant within four months spontaneously afterwards. Another pub publication which also shows you the positive effect of the use of hormonal suppression in those patients. And this is our own experience also on only five patients where we performed an MRI before the treatment and an MRI after the treatment. And where you can see that you have a reduction of the adenomyotic lesion, but it's not disappearing. Becoming small, it's still there, but then the patients are becoming pregnant after So, coming to the uh, conclusion, there are suggestive data that adenomyosis lowers the implantation rate and 
the increase and there is an increase of an abortion rate. These uh, experimental results are due to the different ovarian stimulation protocol used and to the absence of an exact description of the adenomyotic lesion because there is no standardized uh, class classification and we are working now together with FIGO to a classification, FIGO, ESG, ESG, uh, to on the classification of adenomyotis and I hope we will have one maybe at the end of this year uh, and there is a possible effect of hormonal suppression on these other adenomyotis. So endometriosis and adenomyosis are probably primarily a disease of, of the uterus. It constitutes a single entity with variable, probably variable phenotypes and it results from the atrogenic or auto-traumatization of the archimetra with dislocation of basal, uh, of basal endometrium. So there is increasing evidence that a metabolically abnormal ertopic endometrium capable of invading uh, both the peritoneal cavity and the metrium is the uterine link between endometriosis and adenomyosis. And the abnormal juxtasome seems to be the link between these two disorders and the associated major obstetrical symptoms. So thank, thank you very much. Questions? That was a fantastic lecture. Stefan, congratulations. I agree with everything you say, except for the things that I don't agree with. Okay. So I, uh, I'm uh, fascinated to see the update on the etiology of this condition. So I think there are two questions. I may remember or forget the second one. So the first question is, what is the proportion, in your opinion, of when the etiology is childbirth or, or surgery right, versus self-harm, auto-traumatization? What, what is the proportion? Do you have an idea? Is it 90% to 10% or 50-50? I think if you see in, in multipara, you, those multipara have also... And a multipara is childbirth. Yeah, yeah. I'll ask yeah. Finish with that. Yeah, yeah but well, most, what we are seeing of is mostly out of traumatization because most of the patients uh, didn't have got any... Yes, uh, nulliparous, yeah. no surgery or no. some surgery. No, no surgery. Nulliparous, and what proportion do you think is this auto I, I think with surgery, it would be 10 or 20. No, that's surgery, but no surgery. And auto traumatization alone. In patients with endometriosis, it's very high. In patients with endometriosis, okay. you oh, come to 60 Now, the second question I remember is the incidence of adenomyosis increasing? It's increasing because we are seeing the patient at a later, at a later age. So when they are coming to becoming pregnant, that they are already 35 years or 36 years, and you will find more adenomyosis in those patients than in younger patients than 25 years. Okay, so and last question. Sorry, 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 go on. And, and if, you, if I'm going back 20, uh, 20, 20 years, yeah, that's where I want to go. Then yeah. we didn't see this adenomyosis, yeah. but we didn't have these tools to, to, to detect but it. But we had histopathology, we didn't look. We had histopathology at the moment of hysterectomy. Is that enough? Well, we didn't Thank have histopathology no, before. <laughs> Any other questions? Ah. Thank you very much uh, for the fascinating lecture. You know the spiritom, the spiritom, isn't it? The, the biopsy thing. Do you do that under ultrasound guidance or are you just going because it is a centimeter? You said, is there any risk of perforation? Mostly we are doing ultrasound guidance. It's the easiest way. And, and so we all also, sometimes you have intramural cystic adenomyosis, which you cannot see when you do hysteroscopy. So, but when you do it under ultrasound guidance, you can go un ultrasound to the cystic adenomyotic lesion. You are pulling back your, your spherotome, and then you have uh, a way where you can go with hysteroscopy to the cystic. In your clinical practice, um, you're doing it uh, mainly for the research purpose, or in your clinical practice do you do that? For, the, that moment, for the moment, it's only di on diagnostic procedures. We cannot say at this very moment that it's really treatment. So what we are seeing, uh, if you remove adenomyotic cysts, like I didn't show you in detail, uh, or even when you coagulate bi with bipolar and adenomyotic cysts, if you do a control hysteroscopy after 8 to 12 weeks, you always see 
the lesion where you have been operated. That in contrast with a big myoma, that the cavity is completely normal. So the uh, pathology is, com is completely different. And maybe this adenomyotic lesion is invasive the junctal zone, which you do not have with a myoma. I thank you. Any further questions? Thank you, Stefan. Our next speaker is from Ukraine, and that's Dr. Anatoly Kalinsky. He is the head of ART Clinic of National Academy of Postgraduate Education. And he is going to speak on the multidisciplinary approach of endometriosis treatment in infertile patients. Anatoly, all yours. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues. First of all, I'd like to say thank you for our colleagues who come from Europe to us. Thank you for finding this uh, time for us. Thank you for the possibility to share with you our knowledge. And uh, as a director of uh, clinic, IVF clinic, I'll try to speak about uh, endometriosis, which uh, is one of the big problems with uh, patients with infertility. I'd like to start some slides about everyone knows information about epidemiology, that endometriosis is a common gynecological disease. As you can see, a lot of people suffer in the world and also in the, uh, Europe, in Ukraine also. The incidence of endometriosis ranges from 20 to up to 80 percent among operated persons, patients, and uh, during the laparoscopy, diagnostic laparoscopy, we can find more up to 90 percent of uh, endometriosis. Uh, if, if you can see there are a lot of uh, infertility and due to endometriosis. So uh, by the localization, we can find. Everywhere, we, everywhere we, uh, sorry, uh, into the uh, during the laparoscopy, we can find everything. So, the main goal of, of my uh, speech is to trying to divide. What should we do with patients with endometriosis? Should we start with medical treatment? or we should start with laparoscopy, uh, laparoscopy uh, surgical treatment, or we somehow uh, trying to, to divide it. So the medical treatment, as you know, it's conservative hormone. Uh, we use also combined oral contraceptives, projects against intrauterine hormone systems, synthetic steroids, and uh, gonadotropin releasing hormone agonist. Uh, another situation can we can uh, provide the medication uh, prior for laparoscopy. It's uh, so-called perioperative uh, uh, treatment. When uh, we start medication and we see the persistence of hypoestrogenia, reduction of blood loss uh, during surgery, reducing the size of neoplasma, and so on, we can provide the laparoscopic. In our work, we also use the ASHRAE guidelines, and thanks for them, we also get, get uh, nice results, I think. I know everyone knows this. And, uh, okay. So, uh, what is the uh, uh, indication for the acute surgical treatment of uh, genital endometriosis? One of them is uh, endometri endometrial cyst, which uh, size are more than four centimeters, uh, infertility, lack of drug treatment, uh, pure damage of uterine, uh, so on. During the laparoscopic, 
The main goal is to reduce the ovarian injection. I'm, what I'm talking that um, the level of uh, surgeon of uh, who provide laparoscopic should be uh, very high. It's not to do the ovarianectomy. It's, uh, it's very important for the patient who did not provide her um, fertility, and for, for me, uh, for us, like a specialist in the, uh, IVF. In the constant close interaction of different specialists, in order to achieve the most accurate diagnosis and pick the most effective decisions in treatment tactics in each separate case. Moreover, each of the participants physician is responsible for the effectiveness of treatment and uh, possible complications. One of the most frequent manifestations of endometriosis is the syndrome of chronic pelvic pain in women with significantly reduces of uh, quality of life. In this case, this, uh, usually uh, we can uh, uh, see these patients. We, try, we, are, uh, we have to find where endometriosis uh, this uh, um, situates and the success of treatment of this uh, complex disease depends on a coordinate uh, search for the causes of therapeutic effect on them. This is possible in, in the case when every uh, specialist, uh, reproductologist, uh, gynecologist, gastroenterological, uh, it's, I mean, the team, it has to be a great, huge teamwork about uh, of, of treatment of um, endometriosis. Uh, from what we should start? Uh, we we uh, find uh, some kind of algorithm which depends on uh, age of uh, person and uh, the, depends on the stage of uh, endometriosis. We have uh, four stages of um, endometriosis, that's why uh, tactics, tactics, tactics of uh, uh, Tactics of um, uh, uh, treatment a little bit, a little bit differs. Uh, as you can see, the first stage, the second, uh, the third, and the fourth one. And if you can see uh, the difference between the first stage of laparoscopic, laparoscopic is it neat or not, and the second should we use the IVF immediately or we can give a chance of um, pregnancy by themselves. Uh, based on our experience, uh, one of uh, possible uh, plan of managing patients with infertility associated with endometrio endometrioid ovarian cyst. Uh, we had uh, some patients which has a cyst uh, less than 3-4 centimeters and we uh, um, I can give one advice, I don't know our experience that we provide the examination and find this uh, cyst then we make the cyst puncture after that uh, depends on the age and uh, situation of, of infertility we provide the IVF or we go we, um, make a possibility for, for them to make a pregnancy by themselves. We had uh, three months ago one patient which has, who has 38 years old. She had uh, nematuroma 3 centimeters. We provided uh, the cyst function. For now we have uh, eight uh, weeks of pregnancy. They made it themselves. Uh, tactics of managing of endometriosis for each person should be provided very um, individually. Uh, it's a reproductive function of a woman with a diagnosis of endometriosis is not realized. Such patient should consult a reproductologist before starting treatment to preserve the fertility potential and possibility of pregnancy. And uh, for each person, we are trying to find 
her own uh, tech, uh, managing managing of, treat, uh, of treatment. And I'd like to show you one uh, our last uh, clinical case. We had a patient, uh, a patient, 30 years old. She had a uh, fertility. Uh, uh, she had uh, during the examination uh, bilateral uh, ovarian cysts more than uh, six centimeter each. Uh, she had a dysfunctional menstrual cycle. She had a low uh, progesterone and high, uh, high uh, IMH. Uh, we provide first laparoscopy. Uh, also, during laparoscopy, we find a very huge. Um, Adhesion, adhesion, very huge adhesion uh, situation. But we provided the bilateral cystectomy. After removing cyst, uh, she uh, provided three months the uh, differently. Oh, sorry. After the uh, beginning the menstrual cycles. Cycle we begin the um, uh, stimulation. This is a, a schema of stimulation. Uh, after the stimulation, uh, the four hours before trigger, we enter the tritrelin in little dose. Then we uh, also make a, a, a trigger. Uh, we provide the puncture. We uh, achieved 21 oocytes. Then in the fifth day, we achieved uh, eight blastocysts. Uh, we performed the transfer by two of them, and we achieved pregnancy. Now this patient is pregnant. I, I think we'll, we'll, everything will be fine with her. Thank you very much. Questions? Uh, uh, we, uh, uh, I can ask. Uh, I can answer English. Okay. okay. Uh, yeah, the, we are trying this uh, schema uh, with patients with endometriosis and with uh, polycystic oocytes, uh, and. Um, it's the first time which we received a nice uh, result, but, but we only begin to prove it. This, you know. And another question about the needles uh, for uh, aspiration of endometriosis. Which diameter of the needle? Because such needles as we use to uh, aside the tri uh, trial, they uh, often can't. Uh, Yes, so small. No, you know, we use the same needles and we we'll get the results. But after the aspiration of uh, endometrial uh, moss, uh, I, I can change the needle, or in this place I move um, spirit, spirit, and then put, 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 it, put it again uh, back. First of all, thank you for the presentation. And um, to your experience, after surgical removal of ovarian endometrioma, uh, did you have any percentage of uh, uh, spontaneous um, pregnancies or you uh, used um, IVF? And uh, how long did you wait um, after the surgical uh, treatment? Uh, to perform the IVF, and did you have any, uh, did you um, prescribe any um, post-surgical uh, hormonal treatment um, in those uh, women? Thank you for the uh, question. Uh, I'll try not to forget all the questions. Uh, mm -hmm. First of all, uh, not uh, for sure we use IVF immediately after operation. Uh, it depends on the patients. 
if uh, the patient has uh, normal uh, levels of hormones, if we do not, don't have any uh, polycystic, uh, yes, we, go, we allow them for, to forget uh, pregnancy by themselves, and this period uh, contains from three up to six months. <coughs> if uh, after this period pregnancy does not come, uh, they come comes back and we begin uh, IVF cycles. And how much women get spontaneous pregnancy? Uh, I don't know uh, exactly the amount, but I think the percentage is uh, uh, from 40 up to 60 per persons, uh, per percent who, who get the uh, own pregnancy. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was one short question about the uh, the recent approach uh, to all groups uh, IVF patients with endometriosis, endometriosis uh, as well as adenomyosis uh, in the uh, latest data from the Ashray uh, 2016 from Helsinki, Finland. As a recent data show us that uh, there is a strong uh, approach to segmentation protocol in all group of these patients. Uh, get an embryos, freeze all strategy, uh, provide for all of these patients uh, three or six months of agonist of gonadotropin hormone procedure, and after this, uh, embryo transfer of frozen embryos. What do you think about it? Thank you for your question. Uh, for now, we don't use these uh, tactics, but uh, I think we will begin to use it in the patient who has uh, more than uh, 35 years. And um, now I don't have anything to tell you about this, uh, something about our evidence. But uh, we will learn and, and then I'll share with you. Thank you. That's it. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Again, it's going to be Professor Eric. Uh, but first, time. Eric is come all the way from Denmark, and he's going to speak on fertility preservation. He has got the largest series of uh, ovaries that have been chosen, and also among the leading. Uh, surgeons putting ovarian tissue back, mainly on cancer patients. And he's going to share us with his experience. He's asked me for a request to give him a few more minutes to talk, because he has a lot to say. So let's listen to him. Thank you, Kamen, for the kind presentation, and thank you for the organizers to invite me. I'll try to stick within the 22 minutes um, I guess I have a few things to say before I start my lecture, and that is, uh, I'm from a very small country. I'm lovely enough from a country where all uh, hospi hospital admissions are publicly funded. And uh, that might explain why we're doing it as we're doing in Denmark. Also in Denmark, if you are infertile, for different reasons, you are allowed to have at least uh, four, five uh, IUI treatments, and that followed by three IBS treatments. And another uh, important fact is that in Denmark we only have 1.8 children per woman. And um, you, you know to, for, a, for a population to, re to reproduce itself you have to have two and one. And that's the reason why the, the politicians allow us to spend a lot of money on these kind of treatments in the public system. And another uh, thing you might wonder about how people do what, what they do in Denmark is that the average age in Denmark for having the first child is as high as 30 years of age. That's quite, that explains quite a lot of what I'm going to say today. Okay, uh, I declare no conflict of interest and um, my talk is about fertility preservation techniques and uh, you might uh, ask the questions, why focus on fertility preservation? 
Well, one of the reasons is, of course, that the survival rates of young cancer patients has in, increased dramatically. Uh, most of all, because of the modern chemotherapeutic regimes. In these uh, 17 years I have been dealing with ovarian cryopreservation. preservation, uh, the survival rate for Hodgkin's diseases has increased from 90 to 95%. And I mean, that's, that's the hard part of it. It's easy to increase survival rates when it comes to cancer, when you're talking about increasing from 45 to 55%. But increasing the survival rate from 90 to 95%, that's the hard job to do. Of course, you're all um, familiar with the fact that a female is born with a certain number of oocytes they cannot be replenished and, and there's a dramatic decrease to, uh, with age. Um, I just mentioned that gonadotropic, um, gonadotropic regimes for cancer is the most important uh, background for freezing ovarian tissue or cryopreservation of embryos. But uh, of, in a few situations we also freeze ovarian tissue or embryos when we know that the female is from a family uh, where they face premature ovarian failure, very often uh, in the late uh, 20s. Uh, childbearing delay to later in life, so-called social uh, reasons for fertility preservation, are not allowed in Denmark, but it's quite common nowadays in uh, Trump country. I know if you are young, a young CEO employed at uh, Google, for example, or, or Apple, then the company is offering you two or three signs of IVF treatment before you start your job. And also some of them are offered ovarian crime preservation before starting any job. You might divide fertility preservation methods into the well-established and, and the more experimental ones. Of course, the well-established method is, of course, embryo crime preservation. And in the situations where you have to irradiate the pelvis, you can uh, transpose the ovaries to the pelvic wall. Less well-established methods, some would still say experimental, is of course oocyte cryopreservation, ovarian suppression by anti-hormone treatment and ovarian tissue uh, freezing. And the last point would be the main issue of my talk today. Of course, the effect on the ovaries on, of gonadotoxic, uh, gonadotoxic treatment is depending on, on the uh, kind of chemotherapeutic regime, whether you combine different uh, gonadotoxic uh, uh, pharmaceutical uh, preparations, the duration of the chemotherapy, and of course also the age of the female when she starts having gonadotoxic uh, treatment. The alkylating agents uh, listed up front here are the worst ones, the antimetabolites are not that detrimental to the uh, ovarian function. I just mentioned that most of the candidates for ovarian cryopreservation is of course cancer patients, uh, Hodgkin's lymphoma and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, the, the uh, solid tumors, urine sarcoma and Wilms tumor, but we also to our department uh, have referred young females uh, with also immune uh, diseases like uh, acute glomerulonephritis, uh, systemic lupus erythematosus, and so on, facing treatment with gonadotoxic uh, uh, treatments. In a few occasions, we have frozen <coughs> excuse me, tissue from young females going through repeatedly uh, uh, surgical procedures for endometriomas when they are in the risk of, of losing the rest of their ovarian reserve. You're all familiar with embryo price with preservation, so I won't spend uh, time uh, going through that, but just saying that, of course, in very young uh, uh, females or children, this is not applicable. It also demands semen from a husband or the use of donor semen. Um, and in, in in, in a few cases, uh, you cannot, uh, you cannot uh, postpone treatment uh, as long as two to three weeks, the time it takes to do an IVF treatment, especially not in the hematological cancers. Very often when we have young females referred to the department, we are told that they have, go to, they have to start chemotherapy tomorrow or the day after. And in these situations, of course, you cannot offer standard IVF treatment. 
Um, ovarian transposition is a very old technique. Um, when you go into the literature, meta-analysis is not conclusive. Uh, most of the, the studies are not the most important ones. And by the most important studies, I mean time to pregnancy studies. That should be the, the golden standard when you, when you look at it. Uh, most studies just deal with return of menstrual cycles after irradiation. Uh, turning to the experimental methods, oocyte cry preservation. Now that we do not, not many uh, labs nowadays use the long freezing protocol, but they use the vitrification technique, and because of that, uh, the survival rate of uh, freezing uh, unfertilized uh, oocytes has increased dramatically. So this might be an option. Ovarian suppression. There has been certain periods where it has recommended the use of PNRH agonist or antagonist before uh, chemotherapeutic regimes. And to be frankly, I, I don't really uh, understand the rationale be behind that when you consider that more than 90% of the follicles in an ovary are primordial and therefore they are unresponsible, unresponsive to, to, um, uh, to suppression. So, in my opinion, it's more, like, more or less a waste of time, or at least it do not offer that much uh, when it comes to uh, survival rate of oocytes. Uh, we started out in 2000 and we have now frozen approximately 900 cycles and we have just uh, last week uh, carried out the, the, number two, the number 100 auto transplantation. Uh, mind you, when we take out an, an ovary before, uh, before chemotherapy, we only freeze the uh, cortical tissue where all the antral follicles are. Uh, we have started freezing some of the uh, immature oocytes from the pr uh, primary and the secondary follicles, but that's an experimental uh, approach. Uh, the, the idea about the unilateral ovarectomy before chemotherapy is of course to freeze the cortex with all the with all the uh, antral follicles. As you can see here in the young female, there are so many uh, primordial follicles uh, that even there might be a loss during freezing and thawing, there will still be many uh, surviving uh, oocytes. Uh, just to show you that in a, in a very young girl, seven years of age, there's an abundance of, of uh, primordial follicles, and so there's so many follicles that can be frozen. And the youngest uh, person we have operated on was a three-year-old, a three-month-old girl. And um, I'll show you pictures from to illustrate how small an ovary is in a child three months of age. Uh, I do the uh, unilateral ovarectomy, go to the uh, to the lab and cool the ovary down, send it to Klaus Ewing Andersen's lab in Copenhagen, where the freezing procedure is uh, taking place. Uh, the cortex is divided into small pieces and they are frozen separately. So when, when it comes to auto-transplantation, we can decide whether 10 pieces or 15 pieces or 5 pieces, depending on the situation, can be auto-transplanted. Um, in the beginning, we did a test for surviving follicles after freezing and thawing. We did that in new mice, uh, severe combined immune deficiency mice. We don't do that on a routine basis nowadays, mostly because it's very costly. Uh, but we do it in, in special situations, and I'll turn back to that later on. Uh, what we did was, in the beginning, we uh, took a mouse that was ophorectomized a few weeks before, so it had very high levels of SSH and LH. Then we thawed one of, thawed one of the cortical uh, pieces and put it in the beginning under the capsule of the kidney because we know that's a place where there's a lot of vessels. So neoangiogenesis, regeneration of, of the blood vessels uh, is very keen to take place. But nowadays we do it just under the skin because it's such, so much easier just to place a cortical piece under the skin of a skid mice instead of operating on the uh, on the kidney. Here you can see a, a human ovarian tissue piece uh, transplanted under the skin. This is fat tissue, this is the hair follicles. And um, uh, 
when it when you enlarge the pictures, if you, in you enlarge the picture, you can see uh, some of the primordial folds are turned into primary folds. As you can see, the granulosa cells has increased in size and height. They are not flat cells nowadays. Now they are cuboidal, and later on you can see them. They are in more layers, uh, showing that the follicle is alive and divided uh, and uh, growing. I come from this very small country with a population of 5.5 million. So from the very beginning, we decided that the freezing procedure should take place only one at one lab. I mean, doing a laparoscopic orthorectomy, every gynecology can do, and every gynecologist can do that. But uh, the freezing procedure is the, the difficult procedure to carry out. So we send it from Aarhus, my home country, my home city, to Copenhagen, and nowadays also uh, tissue are sent from Sweden to Klaus's lab in Copenhagen. Uh, I have already mentioned that the reason for this is that the hard thing is to do the freezing. Uh, so it, it, makes, it makes sense to centralize uh, this uh, service. And um, from the very beginning we made an estimate together with the oncologist and found out that the need for this procedure in a small country with this population of 5 million people would be something about 100 cases per year and we have now been in the business for uh, 17 years and it seems as our estimates was right. Uh, we freeze from something like 100 uh, young females per year. <coughs> in one situation, in, in the beginning we were very keen about that the transportation time to the lab should be as short as possible. But in one situation, uh, due to bad weather, uh, the, the transport from my hometown to Copenhagen was more than 20, uh, 20 hours, so we were a little bit afraid that the tissue had, da had been damaged. But as you can see in this, um, in this uh, histological slide, that even though it took 20 hours after thawing of one of these small pieces and, and uh, transplanted it into the skin of a skid mice, uh, you can see developing uh, vessels to the uh, primordial folds that are turning into uh, primary folds is showing that even though the transportation time was that long, uh, the tissue survived. Just an example of what not to do. Uh, in a few situations, we, we tried to do IVF uh, treatment, do an ovum, pick up, freeze the uh, oocytes, or in, in, in some situations we froze embryos if, she, if the female had a husband. But uh, as you can see, an, an ovary removed two days after oocyte retrieval looks terrible. And I'll tell you, this uh, cortex is very, very fragile. Illustrated on this, this is how an ovary looks when you have picked up uh, oocytes. No, but you were one of them. The pioneers. <laughs> I mean, when I look at this, I, I mean, I do, I do IVF too, but, but I don't like the idea of uh, making an ovary look like that. Okay, this one, uh, just to illustrate that, of course, uh, the mean age of uh, uh, young females at, at, admitted to our hospital is in the late, uh, late 20s or early 30s. But as I just said, uh, we also uh, freeze ovarian tissue from uh, children. Um, just to illustrate this, the different sizes of an ovary, this uh, millimeter uh, paper is, just, is exactly the same. An adult ovary, an uh, ovary from a five-year-old girl and an ovary from a seven-year-old girl. But of course, this ovary contains many more primordial follicles. It might be that we do not freeze as many small pieces. We cannot freeze 20 pieces from an ovary like this. We might only freeze three, four, or five but each of them will contain many more follicles. Uh, just uh, to remind myself that breast cancer is of course the most uh, often uh, referred uh, reason for ovarian tract preservation and then on the second place the lymphomas, the Hodgkin's and the non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, but as you can see we have also frozen in different benign situations uh, where uh, the situation was that the female was going to face uh, genetic toxic treatment with uh, especially alkylating agents.
uh, luckily enough, very many of the patients actually survive the sense. You could see in this uh, only 14% uh, of the cohort, and that includes all the cancers, uh, uh, diseased, uh, the rest survived. When we do the water transplantation, uh, clouds come to our department uh, with the tissue frozen, and uh, we have this uh, thawing procedure where it has to go through a number of um, uh, baths with physiological uh, saline in order to remove the cry preservation uh, media and introduce um, uh, physiological saline in the cells uh, instead. There are different uh, possibilities of putting the tissue back. What we would like to do is, of course, to put it back in an autotropic place, put it back in the leftover ovary. I mean, if you should have a chance of achieving a spontaneous pregnancy, you have to have the tube just right to it. But of course, it's her own tissue. It can be transplanted to any uh, when the, in her body. So if it's only for making endogenous hormones, it can just as well be uh, transplanted to uh, a subcutaneous pocket in the in the in the stomach or the arm. Single transplantation, uh, we have never carried out, and, and, I, and I doubt that we in Denmark will be allowed it by the ethical committee. But this could be, of course, be a way of avoiding malignant cells that can be hidden in the frozen and thorn tissue. Um, this is how it looks a few weeks after auto-transplantation uh, beneath the skin of an overactomized mice. You can see that it's already made uh, radiant follicles with an, with an mature oocyte inside each of these. This is just some crazy American trying to do open pick up from the forearm, but it can be done. I won't recommend it. Instead, I would recommend that when you do the uh, autotransplantation, we do it by a laparoscopy. We use exactly the same scars as we made when we did the ovarectomy. Uh, most often, we uh, put in the small cortical pieces in the in the uh, leftover ovary like this, and uh, we cannot freeze the tissue again. So. Before the auto transplantation, we do a uh, transvaginal ultrasound to to uh, to measure the size of the ovary, and the ovary is always very atrophic. It might have been something like 1.2 or 3 uh, centimeters before freezing, but after chemotherapy and sometimes auto irradiation, the uh, ovary is uh, very often one centimeter, point a half centimeter. Uh, so, of course, then we cannot put in 10 pieces, but we try to estimate the number we can put in, and if we have thought a surplus, then we just place it, I'll show you a picture in a few minutes' time, just put it in a sub personal pocket, uh, just about the lea cavastus, very often where the ligamentum tears usually go into the inguinal canal. That's very easy to find using, using transvaginal ultrasound later on if you go for an IVF procedure. This is how it looks. We, we use, as I just said, the same scars. We make uh, some uh, a very small uh, laparotomy, gently drag uh, the, uh, next to the uh, surface, put in the uh, thorn uh, pieces of cortical tissue, put in a few stitches, and then slide it back into the abdomen. In order to be able to, to do the procedure as a purely laparoscopic procedure, we very recently started to make uh, larger uh, ovarian cortical pieces. They are just a thin, I mean, the, the primordial follicles in an ovary is in the outer 0.1 millimeter of the cortex. They are just beneath the cortex. So it makes sense to make larger. I mean, it's, uh, it's uh, the width of the, the uh, ovary that makes it possible to do the prior preservation technique. But when you do it as an elongated strip, you can do it as illustrated here, this is a laparotomy, but you can do it as a purely laparoscopic procedure, just gently putting the forceps beneath the cortex of the leftover ovary, and then just dragging the uh, elongated strip in beneath the, beneath the cortex, put in a stitch in every end, in, in each end, and then slide it back. This just to illustrate, if we had a surplus of uh, cortical pieces, we just put them in this pocket, just above the lea cavastus, which are situated here, put in a few stitches, and then an, uh, an oocyte aspiration can be uh, 
can take place just as illustrated here. This is a young female uh, who had her uterus removed when she was 21, 21 years of age. And of course she has to go for surrogacy, but she can, um, she can develop oocytes within this subcutaneous pocket, have them aspirated just in an ordinary way uh, when you, as when you do IVF. And uh, the, the eggs fertilized with her husband's semen and um, transferred as an embryo to a surrogacy mother. Just to illustrate that in the very beginning, of course, we did only uh, cryopreservation, but as you can see here, the number of, of young females coming back for autotransplanting, autotransplantation is increasing year by year. Um, to summarize, all women we have autotransplanted up till now have regained the ovarian function. It takes something like 12 to 16 weeks and in the beginning we could not figure out why it took that long until we came to, to think about that that's the time an oocyte takes to go from uh, FSH independent growth to FSH dependent growth. That always in the literature is estimated as something between 110 and 130 days. So that makes it reasonable to, to, see, to say that the, the uh, the developing oocyte will not survive freezing and thawing. It's the primordial that survives, and they need these two, to, uh, three to four months uh, of FSH independent growth before they can be recruited and become a mature oocyte. In uh, up till now, we have only induced puberty in, in one girl, um, and we have had uh, 15 deliveries, uh, two more to come uh, uh, this spring. Of course, uh, we, we measure the FSH and the AMH after autotransplantation, and as illustrated in this, uh, you can see that they have uh, postmenopausal FSH levels before the autotransplantation, and then within these uh, 15 to 16 weeks, the FSH levels uh, drops down, and around week 15, 16, they very often have their first uh, bleeding episode. Uh, of course, when we do the water transplantation, we take a biopsy from the leftover ovary, the ovary that stayed inside the abdomen uh, during chemotherapy and uh, irradiation, and look for primordial follicles. But you cannot rule out there might be one leftover primordial follicle in that ovary, and the pregnancy might come from that one. We have been criticized uh, that a number of times, so of course, a pregnancy based on a heterotropic uh, uh, transplantation is required to obtain a final proof that the oocyte uh, really originated from the cryopreserved tissue. And just to end up with this case story, in uh, 2003, a young female was referred. Um, she was diagnosed with a borderline tumor on, on, in one ovary, and she, um, she talked to the, the gyne-oncologist and asking him whether it was possible to have the, over, the other ovary frozen. And we were a little bit reluctant about that because we were afraid that she might have borderline changes in that uh, tissue too. But in the end, um, we froze it and she came back eight years later uh, for autotransplantation. And we told her at that time she had to be patient because there were two demands from, from our side. One was that we would like to check some of the tissue in new mice to make sure that they, that they did not contain malignant cells. So she had to wait at least one year because that's the lifespan of a new mice. When a new mice is one year age, it's 85 years of human age. So that was what we did. And we made another option saying that when she become pregnant, which she hopefully did, then we would remove the tissue again. So we put it in, in one of these subpersonal sub pockets. She luckily became pregnant in her third IVF cycle and had twins uh, the year before uh, last year. And in August the same year, we removed the tissue and she is now uh, treated with, with, uh, uh, with estrogen, estrogen and uh, progesterone in a cycle basic. There are still a few questions to be answered. Uh, one, the locality of the ovarian graft. Uh, we have one patient who, who still have a regular menses seven years after autotransplantation. What is the safety? I've been into that. 
And this is one of the key questions, when is a female too old to have tissue uh, crime preserved? I'll conclude that, in, uh, at least in our hands, we think that ovarian crime preservation is a clinical option. Safety is unresolved, but worldwide, I know there hasn't been any relapses uh, reported. And it seems as, at least in combination with ART, it seems as a robust, robust way of preserving fertility in girls and young uh, females. And uh, here, normally you end with a, with a picture of your hometown hospital. We have a very large university hospital, but I like my cows and I like my sheep much better. <laughs> That was fantastic. Uh, I'll allow only one question because we gave Eric five minutes extra to speak. So, yes, please. Thank you very much. One very short uh, remark uh, in defense in uh, methods of crime preservation and education on top of our Well, as I know, in our clinic, uh, in our country, in majority clinic from Europe, uh, this method is I'm absolutely sure the uh, routine method, not experimental. The pregnancy rate, fertilization rate, blastulation rate, variety birth rate is absolutely the same compared to uh, working with fresh eggs, in my opinion. What do you think? I'm glad to hear that, and I mean, my argument nowadays is that if there's time to do an oocyte pickup and freezing of blastocyst, you should do that, of course. and. But, but this might be an option in young girls and in females very, very young. Thank you. So our next speaker is again Professor Stefan Gotz. And he is going to speak on ovarian endometrioma, when to operate. without any doubt that there is a relation between endometriosis and infertility. It's always nice if you can see it published, where it's not solving the question which is the, the chicken and which is the egg, so it's a causal or it's a, which kind is a, the relation between, between the two. Now what I will do is, I, I will have a view with you of the impact of endometriosis on the ovary, and then we will go shortly to, uh, to surgery in IVF, and then we will come to uh, as Anatoly already mentioned, in the guidelines of ASHRAE, you can see that it's mentioned that um, the size of the endometrioma should be larger than 3 cm uh, before they are recommending to perform cystectomy. Now, for where this 3 cm size is coming, there are really no data in the literature, no scientific data telling us that we cannot operate on small endometriomas and that the size has to be 3 cm or four or four centimeters. So this is is uh, is absent, and uh, it is based mostly upon a lack also of training in robotic sur uh, surgery and operative uh, techniques. And it's much more easy to refer patients to IVF program than to operate. So there is really no correlation between the size of endometriomas, the symptomatology of the patient, and the extension of the disease. So mostly we are using for classification of the endometriosis, the American Society cl uh, class classification. Now, this classification is giving you no idea at all about the severity of the disease. It gives you, we can have, you can have a lot of uh, adhesion formation with a small endometrioma, which gives you stage four, and you can have 
uh, a big endometrioma without adhesions or small adhesions which gives you a stage 3. So the severity of the disease is not reflected in the, uh, in the uh, classification of the American society. It only reflects prob uh, probably the difficulty of surgery which you are going, going, going to, to perform. And in the uh, uh, classification, deep endometriosis is not, is not included. So recently, uh, Koenig published uh, the, uh, another class classification system, which is still not very used. But in fact, when for each of the lesions, uh, he gives uh, a, a, a scoring system which more reflects the severity of the disease than does the uh, American society. So, is ovarian damage greater in ovarian cysts of more than 3 cm compared to cysts smaller than 3 cm? Because we should ask us this question. First of all, I would mention that there is a huge difference, and you all know this, between a, de a dermoid cyst and an endometriotic cyst. So, this dermoid cyst is an intra-ovarian cyst, while in fact the endometriotic cyst is an extra-ovarian cyst. So, the endometriotic cyst is due to the invagination of the, of the cortex and in fact it's outside of the ovary and the base of the cyst is in fact the initial cortex in most of the cases of uh, the uh, of endometriosis. Now that there are degenerative changes in patients with endometrioma was already described many many years ago in the publications of Hughes uh, in 1957 uh, where he clearly described that is also an invagination of the cortex. It's not an invasion, but it's really an invagination of, uh, of the cortex. We see that in an endometriomas, there is a lot of free iron, reactive oxygen species, proteolytic enzymes, inflammatory molecules, which is in a concentration 10 to 100 times higher than you normally see in, in the blood sample. And these reactive oxygen spe uh, species can penetrate to the surrounding tissue, activate proteolytic, proteolytic enzymes, and promote the remodeling effect of the basic of the cyst of the ovarian cortex and contribute to the generation of fibrotic tissue. And maybe this generation of fibrotic tissue is responsible <coughs> for the lower concentration of, uh, uh, of follicular density in those patients with endometriosis. And the recent theory of Pearson Way from, from Shanghai is that you have a continuous inflammatory injury of the tissue, which finally uh, will, uh, will finalize in, in fibrosis of the tissue in endometriotic patients and in adenomyotic patients. And this last publication shows clearly that in all the patients with endometriosis and adenomyotis, that you have a very high concentration even abnormally high of platelets in those patients and that probably these platelets plays an important role in the final uh, causal factor of uh, the uh, progression of the disease of adenomyosis and endometriosis. So ovarian endometriosis cyst progression is characterized by a continuous infiltration and invasion of the ovarian interstitium surrounding the cyst and resulting in injury to the ovarian tissue structure and vascular distribution. So you have the fibrosis and you have the microvascular uh, vascular injury which is present in those, uh, in those patients. And in the publications of Kitaima, which has been published with a group from, from Jacques Donnet, this fibrosis was clearly present and also, and this was already present in smaller cysts, smaller than, uh, than, four, than, four cent, than four centimeters. So early diagnosis and intervention may be beneficial in women with endometriomas to protect the ovarian function. And this is a slide which I received from Jacques Bonnet, where you clearly can see the chocolate fluid, you can see the endometrial epithelium here, and you can see the huge fibrosis in the smaller cyst which is present in those patients. It's without saying that in patients with endometriosis, if you compare the anti hormone concentration to a normal fertile patient that without any uh, surgery performed that the concentration of anti hormone of ovarian reserve is uh, <coughs> decreased in those patients. So endometriosis damage the ovarian reserve 
and it's going to be an early sign in young women of advanced ovarian de depletion. Now we can ask us the question, is this antimalarian hormone decrease, is it influenced by the size of endometrioma, yes or no? So, look, going through the literature, this is a publication by Gian Polino, and looking at endometrioma with a size of less than 5 cm, and endometrioma more than 5 cm. And if you see after basal antimalarian hormone level, you see that in fact there is no difference between the small endometrioma and the larger endometrioma, probably indicating that the negative impact of the endometrioma already is present in the small uh, endometrioma, endometriotic cyst. It's different when you have bilateral cysts, there the impact of the, uh, on the endometrioma, of the antimalarian hormone is much higher in patients with bilateral endometrioma than when you have only a, un a unilateral one. And you can see the huge difference between the non-endometriotic cyst and the endometriotic cyst, where the impact of the, of, on the ovarian reserve is much more pronounced in those patients with endometriosis than without. I already showed you this morning that in those patients with small endometriotic cyst, you have active lesions inside of uh, inside of the endometrioma. And again, this is another picture which I give you where you can see in the smaller cyst of 2 cm, this neoangiogenesis is present and the mitral like tissue which, which, which you can see, which you can see here. So already these are signs that already in the small endometriotic cyst, the, uh, it's, it's very aggressive and already in those cysts you can have this uh, firefibrotic uh, uh, process which is which is going on and responsible for the uh, I didn't think in this this is not bad, but okay this is the this is the same so one of the problems is that uh, if you see the the time which uh, is between the, the first symptoms and the final diagnosis of, an, of an endometriosis, then you can see that it takes about 4 to 7 years, 4.7 years before the first medical consult. So we have to make also the patients aware that she has to see the doctor much earlier. But there is another problem that it takes 4.6 years before a final diagnosis is made. So between the initial symptoms and the final diagnosis, it goes up to 9.3 years. And so I like to mention this, in adolescence it's important that we make an early diagnosis because probably in adolescence the endometriosis which we are seeing there is much more aggressive and different from the endometriosis which we are seeing at a later age in those, in those women. And you can see that it's not only minimal endometriosis which you see in adolescence but that also stage 3 and stage 4 endometriosis is present in those, in those adolescents. And in all those patients, we are starting with a normal cycles like this, and at a certain moment, we are faced with a status, status like, like this. So when we are missing all the steps between, we are not paying attention, the patient is not paying attention, and the doctors are not paying attention. So we have to be much more careful in the examination and the anamnesis of our patient, and we have to create awareness of the endometriotic disease and the disaster of which can cause endometriosis. So on the ovarian damage to size matters, I think there's no scientific evidence. I think the ovarian damage is already there in smaller endometriotic cysts uh, compared to larger cysts. Now going to surgery, it's a difficult balance, as already been told by uh, Tony before, uh, in factors favoring sur sur surgery and in factors favoring expectant management because surgery, as, on, uh, as mentioned, as uh, there's a growing concern that there's a serious risk of diminished ovarian reserve if you're going to perform uh, surgery for endometriotic cyst. And one of the uh, problems is the aggressive stripping of the cyst of the extensive and aggressive hemostasis in those, in those, uh, in those patients. On the, other, on the other hand, we know if you're going to operate upon patients with endometriosis and the male factor is normal, that you will have a spontaneous pregnancy rate after six months to one year, which is around 50 to 60%. These are all data from Vaselina. This is 
the experience we had many years, many years ago when we performed the microsurgical procedures for, for endometriosis. These are more recent data uh, published in 2015 where you also can see that the pregnancy rate after uh, you are performing surgery for endometriosis is about 50 is about 50 percent. Now looking at the difference between an ablative uh, cert surgery and the cystectomy. So if you look at the difference in cyst smaller than five centimeters and in cyst larger than five centimeters, then you can see that the negative impact of performing a cystectomy in the large endometrioma upon the ovarian reserve is much higher when you're performing cystectomy than when you're performing an ablative cert surgery. While in the smaller cyst, you can see that there's practically no difference. So, cyst in those size matters when you are going to perform surgery? Yes, because your damage that you are going to do upon the ovary, uh, the ovarian reserve, is much higher when you are operating upon uh, this larger ovarian cyst. And if you know a little bit of, uh, math of mathematics, then you can see that depending upon the diameter of, of the cyst, the total volume and the surface is exponentially increasing uh, in the cyst of 3 cm, it's 14.30, 9.43 and 4 cm is already high. So the larger the cyst, the higher your negative impact will be upon the uh, ovarian uh, reserve. And therefore, it has been proposed uh, already many, many years ago <coughs> that in the case of ovarian endometrioma larger than 5 cm, a two-step procedure should be performed and this has been proposed, suggested by Jacques Brunet and by Jacques pa George Patters from, from Thessaloniki. And these are the results of, the, uh, of, of Jacques Brunet, uh, where you can see ovarian volume and antifollicular count in, uh, of the follicles in women without uh, endometriosis and in women with it. So there is clearly a bit beneficial effect when you perform it in a two-step uh, two step uh, surgery. These are the data from, from Pardos. Also when he do, he calls it a twist because he gives generation along between the first and the second uh, operative procedure. And you can see that the impact upon the ovarian reserve is less when you're performing a two step uh, a two step uh, procedure. Now the discussion about ablation and cystectomy is going on, but now with the new techniques are coming on like the plasma jet and this is, is a uh, publication of uh, uh, Roma in, from France where you compare the use of plasma jet versus cystectomy and you can see that in using the uh, plasma jet the impact of the ovarian reserve is less than when you perform cystectomy. So cystectomy in fact gives you more damage of the of We are now for, for many many years we are using a bipolar probe which is not coagulating so deeply when uh, compared to a bipolar force because the bipolar force uh, is more detrimental for the for the cortex. This is uh, coagulating very superficially and it's going not deeper than one or two uh, one or two, two millimeter. And one of the advantages is that uh, you have no carbonization at all. It is an instrument uh, where you can rinse, irrigate and where, where you can coagulate and which is not uh, expensive at all. Again, another uh, publication compares cystectomy versus, uh, versus ablation and again you can see that the impact of, uh, uh, of ablation is less than the impact of cystectomy. Now going to IVF, the size matters. Yes, size matters because if you have a very large cyst, it will be, give you much difficulties for performing the, for performing the puncture. You will have less follicles to develop and maybe you will not be uh, uh, you will not be able to reach these follicles for, uh, uh, for aspirating it. You have the risk of an inadvertent puncture of the endometriotic cyst, uh, which is then coming into the full follicle fluid. And also you have a risk of ovarian abscess uh, when you are aspirating this endometriotic cyst. Because this is different when you aspirate the, the follicles, because follicle is bleeding, uh, and endometriotic cyst is closed. So if you bring in some infection, it, stay, it, stays, it stays in. 
On the other hand, we know if you're performing IVF, you can have less fall follicles, but finally your pre pregnancy rate and embryo transfer will be, will be the same. I just like to show you this presentation already published in 2010 from Petro Bari, where in patients with en en endometriosis, he first performed uh, sur surgery in those, in those patients where he had a pregnancy rate of 54%. Then those patients who did not become pregnant were sent into an IVF program, and so uh, another percentage was added. While compared to a group of patients where he performed directly IVF, the final pregnancy rate was only 32%. So first uh, surgery done IVF, so finally the pregnancy rate was higher. If he does nothing, then spontaneous pregnancy rate is around 11.8%. So it's very difficult to tell you what to do in patients with endometriosis. So there are concomitant factors, and each treatment has to be individualized depending upon the age of the patient, the pain, the severity of the disease, the presence of deep infiltrating endometriosis, previous operations, and the uh, coexistence of male, inf inf male infertility. So coming to the conclusion, ovarian reserve, ovarian damage is already present in small endometriomas. Uh, surgery has a negative impact and is more important after surgery in case of large endometrioma and is more pronounced after cystectomy compared to ablation. And you can discuss the recurrence rate. The new data from Roman shows that the recurrence rate is not higher after ablation than after cystectomy. And in large endometriotic cysts, it's recommended to perform a two step uh, procedure. IVF is more technically difficult and you will have less follicular development. So the ovarian endometriosis is the cause of reduced ovarian reserve. Early diagnosis and intervention may be beneficial in women with endometriosis to protect their ovarian function. And I personally believe that you, if you can intervene in a very early stage, but also your ovarian damage will be minimum compared to operating upon a much larger ovarian system. Surgery for ovarian endometriosis results in spontaneous pregnancy rate of approximately 50%. It results in reduced ovarian reserve, more detrimental after, <coughs> after cystectomy. And in case of large endometrioma, a two-step procedure is recommended. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Maybe some questions, but a little. <laughs> yes, there is one question. <coughs> Yes, I can do. Uh, do you measure MHH hormone before and after uh, operation all the time? Or just for... Um... We are doing it. Yes. Okay, we and one more little question. Um, speaking about IVF, um, have you done IVF with endometriomas? Or have you... How often? Do you remove them more often or you are doing function with them? What are you doing more often? They Depending on the clinical circumstance, if a patient are coming to see us for the first time and we are seeing an endometrioma and the male is, is normal, then we are going first to operate her and give her the probability to get in pregnant spontaneously. If we are seeing patients with, which is at age or where there is male infertility or which have got already an operation before, then we are performing directly IVF except when the cyst is two, six or seven cysts. And how is the quality of the cells after that? The, there, is no, there is no difference in quality of the embryos. You have less embryos, so you have less, less oocytes, less embryos, but the quality of the embryos is okay. So the implantation rate and your pregnancy rate compared to controls is the same, but you have less, less, less oocytes. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think that's all. Thank you. We'll move to another speaker. Another speaker, Dr. John Wattblood. I think everyone who provides laparoscopy or some kind of operation is afraid of complication. I think it should be a nice presentation. Please, for the last time, in the last presentation, so I will try not to bother you too much. Just to remind everybody that we have a very brief lecture after this talk from one of our young colleagues here who has done something interesting.
the only a brief talk, so just after this lecture. So this is not the last lecture. One small talk after that. <laughs> okay. So the last presentation is more about the, I will say, psychotechnical skill that we have to have when you do laparoscopy, and uh, the title could be how to keep your brain in case of major complications. So first of all, uh, we have to know that the complication, and even sometimes the thought to have a complication, generates stress. So the stress is normal, could be useful, but it has to be minimized, that it is your surgical skill, has to be controlled, that it is a non-technical skill, and the problem is if the stress goes too far, because we will see that we have a very rapid decreasing of your surgical performances. So, when the stress goes too far, so then in case of major complications, so sometimes chronically, by accumulation of chronic stress, what happens? We can, well, I think everybody has seen that in the operating room, people shake the surgeon, shaking, shouting, bad response to the complications. That we have what we call the tunnel effect, it means that you have the, your vision which is impaired, you just see in the middle of your screen, but not at the periphery, and the information came very often to the periphery of your visions. And also we have to know, we have demonstrated in France, that it is contagious to the team, and if it is chronic, it may lead to the burnout, which is now quite a common phenomenon. And so we may rapidly have a disaster. So how to avoid the bad consequences of stress on surgical performances? I think I have to, there is some possibilities, but I think the ACT attitude is not bad. A for awareness, C for communication and counseling, and team for teamwork and training. And we are going to see some of this aspect. So what is the awareness? And that is in laparoscopy very important. It is uh, that you have to know that the complication may occur at any time before the patient enters the operating room until the post-operative fails. And it is uh, something which is important because complications are mandatory. You know this rule of two, which is quite, I think, useful and true. When you have a surgeon telling his number of performance cases divided by two, and when he tells his complication work, multiply it by two. I think it is probably quite accurate. So awareness, situation awareness is the mental representation we have of a situation frequently actualized by evaluating the situation like in these pictures. And that it is something which is very important when you do laparoscopy as well. So some small video, this one is quite quick, but I will show you probably twice. Look this truck car, look this guy, look. You see immediately, just a small mistake, because it just don't look at what happens. I'll show you again, because it is very quick, you see? The truck car, directly in the aorta. Now I give you the cue, it is not a human, it is a pig. But anyway, it is a set. You see what happens when you do this kind of, of mistake. And I think that when you have seen that once, you'll be very careful when you put your second truck car. Also, the bad attitude, I will say in general you have two hands. Look, this, this is not quite a big complication. You know there is some beginning at the beginning of uh, paroscopy, it is in uh, general surgery, and look at the surgeon. You, you see, he sees the bleeding and you imagine that he has some panic, so he has a forceps and he puts the forceps with the viewing directly in the human tube. And so instead of using this, this other hand to remove that, look how it is doing. By chance, the, the bleeding is, is not too much. But look, it's trying to, it is stuck, it tried to move. You see, moving a lot. During that time, it is, the, the bleeding is, is continuing. Imagine it is a big vessel, it is a cell. Look at the time that it takes. When we have a bleeding like that, it could make the difference between life, life and death, you know? And so, Finally, at the end, he's going to, to remove that, and now he's going to probably act properly. And, and you see, if this guy have not keep, if I keep a brain, what he have done? He just have put a second hand, just to remove gently the, the epiplone, you know? Simple things. It means that, that it is a stress, the result of the stress. So what to do in case of major complications? And I think that the, <coughs> the main complications, what we most experimental that we have seen, it is the big vessel injury during entry. What to do? First of all, I think we have to, to stay calm 
and told him, Batman, of course, but a colleague, that it is the rule number one. If you have a major injury, major vessel injury, you have to call a colleague because you cannot do by yourself everything. I think that it is very important, so we have to be prepared to stay calm and focused, and also to know your limits. Be prepared me, to have a specific checklist when you start a laparoscopy. Never ever start a laparoscopy without mean of coagulation, suction and irrigation, and that will be already to use and already checked. In my OR, I never do, even if it's a very simple laparoscopy, without that, because if you have any problem, that makes once again the difference between the life and the death of the patient. On these patients, I think we should have protocols, that it is a kind of protocol, there is other one. For in case of vascular injury, we have this acronym, the SAS. The stop bleeding first, alert the team, if, once again, alert the team, accept the type of bleeding, and secure the bleeding site. Also, you have to know your limits. And I think that it is something which is important when you do laparoscopy. I show you this video. Okay, look. Yes, it is the use of plasma jet, we are speaking about that. Very efficient, but you have to be cautious. Look, a big bleeding, because it is a, a artery, big artery. You, you see this guy is good, so he does not panic. First of all, he controls the bleeding. At that time, if you have not very skillful in laparoscopy, nobody will, will say anything if you convert in laparotomy. So if you are not sure of you, at that time, you just control the bleeding, you call a colleague, and you convert. If you are good enough, then you can do as he's going to do. So, look, he has the asphyxiation operation, so he can see where the bleeding is, he controls the bleeding site, and so he says, okay, we may probably make the reparation. But you see, uh, everything is, is ready. Obviously, it is a good surgeon, so he wants to see exactly what happens. You see, it is a hole of five millimeters in the uh, part of the iliac artery, so he cannot make the coagulation, he has to repair it. So either you call the vascular surgeons, or you can do what he what he's going to do. You see, he puts two clips, but we know that we cannot keep the clip, because if not, we have a problem with the vascularization, and then we can make the reparation. You know, now we are, we are able to make proper suture of this uh, vascular Hole, and that we can do that only if you know that your limits are, are far from that. And at the end, you just gently remove the clip and you see the artery goes again. So it means that uh, it is not a catastrophic problem. You know, if you are good enough, you can do that. But if not, once again, do an laparotomy immediately. Awareness also, it is to diagnose any complications. We should never have this kind of secondary laparoscopy where we miss, probably the, we miss a small hole in the bowel and the end we have this kind of situation. So it is really important when, if you have any uh, indication that we may have a bowel perforation to really check and, make, and take the proper decision. Then ACT, C, it is for communication and counseling. And I think that, that it is prior to the operation, information and consent are of critical importance. Because if you have complications, if you know that you have, uh, the, your patient knows that in advance, so the, the management of the complications will be more uh, easy for you, you will be less stressed. So that, I think it is something which is important. And if you have a complications, communication and counseling also it is after the operation. You have to show empathy. Sorry works, you have to, be, to, to say to the patient that we are sorry, so we have to show empathy, but no apologize, no apologize. even if you feel guilty, because before the full, the full case review, you never know if, if it's really your fault or not. So words are important, communication is important, and it is also important to show to your patient that you have to show empathy to your patient. Then ACT, the T is a teamwork and training, and that it is something which is not new because you know in the aeronautics they know that very very well but it is something which is important for us and especially in laparoscopy we have a lot of uh, new technique and we have uh, and the team is very important we have to know that a complex activity like for instance laparoscopy 
we do in average three to five errors per hour on average. 80% will be recovered by yourself, and 20% are recovered by the ergonomic and by the team. So we have to rely on your team, we have to have a good team, because it will prevent a lot of, of problems. We all do mistakes, no matter how good we are, so that also is something we have to keep in mind. But also we are the leader. We are the leader, we have to motivate the members of the teams, to manage the team resources, to maintain the cohesion of the group, and to listen to the team. And it is, you know, like a conductor of the orchestra, and we have to revendic that, you are the leader, you are not to... Of course, we can, we could be democratic in the, in the OR, but when you have a complication, we have to be very directive. Therefore, even if some complications are unavoidable, unavoidable a lot are, and the difference between what the aeronautic calls the near miss and the disaster depends on the quality of the management by the surgeon and his team. So, briefly, some take home messages. First of all, be prepared mentally that it is the awareness. I think that it is an attitude that we should have all the time when we do complex activity like laparoscopy. Be trained to react properly that it is your skill. And if you have seen that to have good skill, you can do a lot of things. Be a team leader, that it is very important. But overall, stay human, it means the brain users. And just to finish on a small joke, I think that you will say that even there is almost always a solution, so never give up like in this situation. I'll leave that to you. Thank you very much. Thank you for the nice presentation. It was very fun and very useful for us. Maybe some questions? No, thank you. Thank you again. Dear colleagues, please, the, the last presentation from our colleague from Odessa, Vladimir Dasheshkin. He has five minutes, please. Take, take, take your time. Я постараюсь очень коротко, у меня, в общем-то, большой доклад, но Эдис мне дал только пять минут, поэтому речь пойдет не обо всех вопросах, а только о идентификации плотной эфимбри, поскольку это необходимая вещь в диагностике необъяснимого бесплодия. В диагностике, ну, это для наших коллег, я в двух словах скажу. Значит, э, одна задача – это уточнение функционального состояния проходимых фаллопиевых труб. Вторая задача, которая может э, позволить решить этот метод – это визуализация э, развития стигмы овуляции, ее различных стадий для того, чтобы определить близость к моменту овуляции, что необходимо в натуральных циклах авеев. Используется метод мобильного гидроакна, который описан в одной из наших статей. Я не буду останавливаться на задачах, у нас мало времени. Вот как работает метод мобильного гидроакна акустического окна. Пожалуйста. Здесь не используется 
ничего, кроме физиологических жидкостей. Это может быть жидкость после овуляции или какая-либо другая жидкость, эксудат, принсудат. Мы можем видеть буквально все отделы флотливых труб. Вы видите interstitial junction, вы видите угол трубный, справа вы видите яичник, ампулу трубы и фанел, воронка трубы с фимбриями. Буквально пару слов о функциональном состоянии воронки. Первичные фимбрии, их 10-15, выдающиеся фимбрии аварика, они все эти первичные фимбрии окружены секондарь фимбрии, вторичными фимбриями, которые собираются капиллярным рисунком в продольные глубокие складки.